Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and today's saint is Saint Katiri Tekakwitha. Now, growing up, I loved the name Katiri. I thought the name Katiri was the most beautiful name that a girl could have, and so I tried to convince my parents to name either of my two sisters Katiri, but it never ended up happening. My mom said that she was having the baby, so she got to name the baby, and so I never had a sister named Katiri, but I still think it's a beautiful name, and it's a beautiful saint to go along with this name. Uh, Katiri Tekakwitha is also sometimes called by the, her title, Lily of the Mohawks. And as this title suggests, Katiri was born into the Mohawk tribe of Native Americans. She was the first Native American woman to be canonized a saint of the Catholic Church. She was born in 1656 in the region that is now known in the modern day as the state of New York in the USA. But she died in Canada, so she lived right along the border between Canada and the United States in that region. Now to understand what Katiri's life looked like, we need to understand what was happening historically during this time. Before the Europeans had come to North America, the native peoples of Canada and the United States were separated into many different tribes, many different nations. And one such nation was called the Iroquois, and they were made up of a confederacy of six different tribes. And one of those tribes was the Mohawk, the Mohawk tribe. And this tribe is the one that Katiri was born into. Now, when the Europeans came, countries like England and France and Holland, all of them were vying for power and wealth in the New World. And so all of these different groups, both the native and the European, were always making alliances with each other, breaking alliances, fighting with themselves, all at different points in order to establish themselves on the continent. And into this confusing time of, of wars and alliances, our saint, Katiri Tekakwitha, was born. Now, I don't want you to get the understanding that Katiri is her first name and Tekakwitha is like a last name. Uh, Tekakwitha is her native name, the name that she had amongst the Mohawk. Uh, when she was baptized, she was given the name Katiri, but we'll explain a little bit more about that later. Tekakwitha was born to a Mohawk father and an Algonquin mother. So the Mohawk had gone on a raid against a neighboring tribe called the Algonquin, and they had kidnapped, they had captured an Algonquin woman and brought her back to the village. And she had eventually married into the tribe, and this was the family that Tekakwitha was born to. Her father was a pagan. He wasn't Christian. He worshipped according to the religion of the Native Americans at that time. It was very uh, pantheistic, animistic. They believed that everything was imbued with some kind of spirit that could be either good or bad. They were always trying to appease the spirits that lived in the spirit world. They had this idea of some great spirit that was over and above all the other spirits. And the Native Americans at that time had what they called shamans. And these shamans were like witch doctors or magicians that could communicate with the spirit world through all kinds of various occult rites. But Tekakwitha's mother, the Algonquin woman, was Christian. She had been evangelized earlier by French missionaries, and so Tekakwitha was born into a family of mixed religion. But when little Tekakwitha was only four years old, the smallpox plague swept through her village. So when the Europeans came to North America, they brought many diseases with them, including smallpox, that the native immune systems weren't ready to handle. And so many of them unfortunately died, including Tekakwitha's parents and her younger brother. Tekakwitha herself contracted the disease of smallpox, which left her face scarred and pockmarked from the disease, and it also left her vision very weak, so she couldn't see very well. This is actually where her name, her native name, came from, because Tekakwitha means she who bumps into things, which is not a very flattering name, but 
That's what it was. And so uh, Tekakwitha, as a little four-year-old orphan, was adopted by her aunt and uncle. Her uncle was a chief of the Turtle Clan, uh, which was a subsection of the Mohawk, and she went and lived with them. Well, later on, that village was attacked and burned by French troops during a war between the Mohawk and the French, and many Mohawk were killed in the battle. And afterwards, the defeated Mohawk sued for peace with the French. They didn't want to fight anymore. And so when Tekakwitha was only 11 years old, Jesuit missionaries came to her village because the Jesuits were French. Uh, the Mohawk dignitaries had gone off to broker a treaty with the French and they returned with some of the French missionaries. And these French missionaries stayed in the lodge of Tekakwitha's uncle for three days. And in just those three days, little Tekakwitha, only 11 years old, was evangelized by these missionaries and she accepted the gospel in her heart. She began to fall in love with Jesus, but they were not able to baptize her. They were moving on too quickly, so she wasn't baptized. But she was a Christian in her heart. Now, soon after this, according to native custom, when women would normally be married very young, around 13 or 14 years old, her aunt and uncle tried to marry Tekakwitha off, but she kept refusing. She wasn't interested in marriage. And there was a couple of reasons why this was happening, why this was the case. Uh, Tekakwitha, by nature, her personality, she was very shy. She was very quiet. Uh, and she was also pretty self-conscious about the scars on her face. She was embarrassed by them. She would often walk around the village with her face and head wrapped in a blanket in order to keep herself hidden. So she was naturally shy, but she also had this newfound Christian faith, this newfound love of Jesus. And even as a smaller child, she had a sense that she was supposed to save herself for Jesus alone, not for any other man. And so at one point, her aunt and uncle even tried to trick her into marrying someone they gave her a bowl of stew to give to a man who was one of her suitors. And according to the tribal customs at the time, if she offered him this bowl of stew and he accepted, a marriage could be contracted. And she realized what they were doing and she threw the soup in the fire and she ran away and hid in a field to avoid him. So these constant refusals of marriage really angered her adopted family. They began to treat her very coldly, no longer as a member of the family, but as one of their servants. They had her do all of the hard work, all of the menial labor to kind of get back at her for refusing to get married. But she did all of it with humility, kindness, and gentleness with great joy. Now, when Tekakwitha was older, around 19 or 20 years old, she met a man named Father Jacques de Lamberville. He was a French missionary who was acting as a missionary in her area. And he came upon her in her lodge while everyone was away. And he began to catechize her in secret, teach her more about the Catholic faith while her family and neighbors were away. And she asked him to be baptized, which eventually he did. And she was baptized with the Christian name of Catherine, which translated into her Mohawk tongue was Katiri. So that's where the name Katiri Tekakwitha comes from. Katiri also at this point realized that she wanted to become a virgin for Jesus at this point and she vowed that she would never marry. She would save herself for Jesus alone. Now of course this just made her pagan family even more angry. Not only had she converted but she continued to avoid getting married and so they began to treat her even more worse. Uh, the neighbors in her village shunned her. She was ostracized. Uh, they mocked her for betraying her people by taking the religion of the Europeans. Uh, they treated her as an outcast. They accused her of sorcery. The, the village children would throw rocks at her as she walked through. And some of them even began to threaten her with serious physical violence. At one point, uh, a Mohawk warrior came into her lodge and brandished a war club at her and threatened her for being a Christian, said he was going to kill her. But Katiri was unfazed. She calmly knelt down before him and told him that she wouldn't abandon 
her faith in Jesus. And he was so amazed that this shy, quiet, timid girl was so calm in his presence that he dropped his club and he fled from her. Her humility had overcome him. And so Kateri Tekakwitha was having a really rough time being ostracized by her community, but at the same time, she was also surrounded by the pagan religion of her people. The shamans, the, the magical feasts and ceremonies were constantly around her, and it was hard to practice her Christian faith. Uh, the Mohawk were also known for their ritual torture and sometimes cannibalism, and so their religion was very dark, and she realized that she had to escape from this toxic environment if she was going to keep growing in holiness and her love of Jesus. And so her priest friend arranged for her to escape. He told her about a Christian settlement of native converts who had all gathered together, no matter what tribe they were from, they had gathered together to live as Christians in community. And she wanted to go and live there. And so while her uncle was away on a trading trip, Katiri Tekakwitha saw her moment and smuggled herself out of the village and escaped. And even though her uncle quickly realized her absence and began to chase her, she hid from him and she escaped, eventually taking a canoe up to a Christian village in Quebec, Canada, modern day Canada. Now at this Christian mission where Katiri was able to escape to, she was taken under the protection of another Christian convert named Anastasia. And Anastasia had actually been friends with her mother. So Anastasia became like a, a spiritual mother figure for Kateri in this new home she found herself in, and the two became very good friends. Kateri surrounded herself with the other Christian women in the community, and these particular women were in the habit of performing pretty intense forms of penance to grow in holiness. And so Kateri Tekakwitha dived right in with the same kind of penances. And she would sometimes put thorns in her bed so that she would uh, have them pierce her skin as she was sleeping. She would uh, beat herself with branches. She would whip herself with branches. She would pray the rosary barefoot out in the cold of the Canadian winter and all these other penalties and uh, penances that she would impose upon herself in order to suffer for the good of souls. Now you might be listening to this and thinking, Isaac, this sounds really weird. This sounds bizarre. Is this something that we should be doing as Catholics? Should we be whipping ourselves or, or stabbing ourselves with thorns? What's going on here? And we should talk about it for a little bit because it's very easy to misunderstand what's happening here. You see, in the history of the church, different saints at different times would practice different penances of various kinds in order to mortify their own flesh and grow in holiness, but also for the sake of offering up intercession for others. They would offer up their sufferings for the sake of others. And all of these penances, no matter what they were doing, were painful to the body in some way. And Jesus teaches us that fasting is a part of the Christian lifestyle. In fact, Jesus exemplified for himself to take upon himself the pain of fasting when he went into the desert and fasted without food or water for 40 days. So this has always been in our understanding of one of the ways we can draw closer to God. But Paul goes a little bit further. St. Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, when he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, that is, the church. So you might hear this and think to yourself, is Paul saying that Jesus' death wasn't enough for our salvation, that we're supposed to add something to it through our own suffering? No, this is not what St. Paul is saying. Uh, Jesus' death was all that was necessary for our salvation. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he meant it. The blood of Jesus, his sacrifice, have infinite value. They're powerful enough to save us all. We don't need to add to that. What Paul is talking about here 
And what is happening with all of these saints that are doing penances is that Christ's suffering is not complete in the sense that it is not yet applied to everyone subjectively yet. So that means that our sufferings can be the means by which Jesus's merits can be applied to people, acting with our penance as a form of intercession. So just as an analogy, imagine that you're praying for someone to be saved. You're praying that uh, an unbelieving family member of yours would come to repentance and faith in Jesus. And then that person does eventually come to faith in Jesus. Well, you're prayer didn't add anything to Jesus's death, and it was Jesus's death that saved that person. But your prayer was the means by which God drew them to himself, that God drew that person to himself so that Jesus's merits could be applied to him. And that is, on some level, what's happening here with these penances that saints are taking upon themselves. That is the, the value of our fasting and our penances, our suffering, that we offer up for others. Now, the level of suffering, the level of penance that we should impose upon ourselves has been up for debate in the Catholic Church. So throughout church history, there has been times where it was more widely accepted, like for instance, in Kateri's time, this was a common thing for Catholics to do. But there was also times when the church condemned certain groups for going too far with their penances. So, for instance, uh, in 1349, Pope Clement VI condemned a group called the Flagulants because they would go from town to town beating themselves with whips, trying to atone for their own sins, and they were taking it too far. They were mutilating themselves too much, and so the Pope put his foot down and said, enough is enough. This is to be condemned. This is to be suppressed. Now, even Kateri, St. Kateri Tekakwitha, was told by some of her friends and directors to tone down some of her penances, that she was taking it too far, and she humbly and obediently listened to them. And so she, she reined it in a little bit and didn't become so extreme with her penances as she was used to. Now, as it stands right now, you might be wondering, well, in order for me to become a saint, do I have to whip myself? Do I have to starve myself? Do I have to sleep out in the snow and do all these things? No, you don't. Uh, there are a few guidelines that the church has towards penance, and I wanted to share some of those with you because all of this is to help us grow in holiness, right? And so first things first is we need to be able to receive with joy the sufferings that already come towards us naturally. Without adding anything, we're supposed to suffer the crosses that are already in our life. The second thing we need to keep in mind is that any kind of rigorous penance that goes kind of above and beyond uh, regular penances that uh, are, are more normal should be talked about and given permission by a capable spiritual director because a spiritual director will be able to know when someone is trying to do penance in order to genuinely become holy as opposed to someone who is uh, has maybe a problem with hating themselves and so they're trying to Christianize that hate for themselves by hurting themselves or people who are trying to inflate their pride by saying that they do more penances than other people and so they're more holy. So these are dangers when it comes to extreme penances. And so in all of these cases, one great rule of thumb when doing penance is that everything that you do needs to uphold the dignity of your body. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And so as temples of the Holy Spirit, our bodies are gifts from God. They are not to be mutilated. They are not to be abused, but they are to be used as a way to draw closer to God in holiness. Does that make sense? And this is what was happening with Kateri. She did all of her penances out of love for God, a desire to offer up her sufferings for the further conversion of her people. And she was obedient to her directors when they told her that some of her penances were too extreme and she needed to dial it down a little bit. Now, overall, Kateri's health was never Good. She was never quite healthy, and eventually she caught an illness that got worse and worse. And she eventually died at the young age 
of 24. And she died surrounded by her friends and beloved priests who were praying for her. And immediately after her death, a miracle took place because her face, which had been pockmarked and scarred by her childhood disease, was miraculously cleansed. Her face was healed after she died, and her face had no more marks of smallpox on it, which was this miracle that all those who watched her die attested to. Now, Katiri Tekakwitha was canonized a saint in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI, and he had allowed a miraculous healing to be attributed to her in order for her to be canonized. A young six-year-old boy named Jake Finkbonner, he was an American boy, had been playing baseball and he had cut his lip, but through that cut, a deadly flesh-eating disease had entered into his body and it was very serious. Within only four days, little Jake was near death. He was in a coma. Doctors were hopeless. They couldn't stop the spread and his parents were having to make difficult decisions about organ donation. That's how serious it was. But Jake's father had Native American heritage, and he remembered hearing stories of this holy woman, Katiri Tekakwitha, as a child. And so with the advice of his priest, they summoned relics of Katiri Tekakwitha to be brought, and they prayed over their son with those relics. And from that point onward, the infection stopped spreading. And so the Vatican asked that a study that doctors and scientists would look into the reported miracle, and they found that the healing of little Jake was unexplainable by medical scientific means. And so the miracle was attributed to St. Kateri Tekakwitha, and she was canonized a saint, a beautiful saint. And I have actually been to pray with her relics at her tomb in Gananoque, uh, Quebec, in modern-day Canada. And it's in a little church on a native reserve there. And I was struck by the simple style of the church. It was a beautiful church, but it was small and it was unassuming. And I could sense the presence of this little saint, St. Kateri, this humble saint who was so beloved by her people when I was there in that chapel. So let's all pray for the intercession of St. Kateri Tekakwitha right now so that we can become saints like she was. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Kateri Tekakwitha, we ask through your intercession that we would be able to follow Jesus even when it's countercultural. Let us follow your example that even if we are mocked, misunderstood, rejected by our family and friends, that we would not give up on our faith in you, Jesus. St. Kateri, uh, teach us how God is calling us to offer up penance for the sake of others, to bear our crosses bravely like you did. And through the intercession of St. Kateri Tekakwitha, Heavenly Father, we ask for a blessing on all indigenous peoples all over the world, that they would be blessed through Kateri's intercession that she would pray for her people, that God would bless them, care for them, give them all that they need. We pray for continual peace and reconciliation between all peoples, all tribes, all nations, so that we may be one people in Jesus. St. Kateri Tekakwitha, Lily of the Mohawks, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.